Did, did anyone uh, check that talk out? Yeah, all right, some people, that's cool. So that was interesting because uh, back then, and that's one year ago, right? Uh, we were kind of experimenting with Angular 1 and combining that with TypeScript and seeing how that would work. Uh, and then one year later, the shock, we had like an incredible shock, right? Because, and that, that shock was that uh, Microsoft and Google actually decided to combine those two things in the next generation of Angular. I was totally shocked by that uh, because uh, we were actually just having fun and seeing uh, and giving TypeScript some love, right? <laughs> so, but then this actually turned out to be true. As a matter of fact, the shock was, it could be compared to when uh, Steve Ballmer laughed at the iPhone, uh, at the iPhone, the first iPhone, <laughs> uh, at how expensive it was when it was uh, announced in 2007. And then later, six years later, he would announce the Lumia 1020 to about the same price. So the shock was about the same. Yeah, so uh, very interesting. So, NG Europe. Uh, as you know, in NG Europe, um, last year, uh, the Angular guys uh, announced that they would deprecate Angular 1. Angular 2 would be completely different. And that was kind of, uh, kind of a shock in the community. And I'm pretty sure that you guys also were shocked the, uh, if you work with Angular today. How many work with Angular, by the way? Whoa, it's a full room. That's really cool. So I'm pretty sure you were sh as shocked as me when you heard this news, right? Uh, so, you know, the Angular 2.0 announcement backfired in the community. People were really angry. Uh, they didn't know what was going on because everyone was happy with Angular 1. But the thing is that, you know, React was, uh, I'm going to say this and don't shoot me for that. That's my theory only, uh, of course. I think when React was announced, the Angular 1 uh, guys thought that they had to do some changes, right? Because performance-wise in Angular 1, I mean, when, you, when, when applications scale, it really becomes slow, right? It's, it's not really great in performance, but it has an awesome architecture, Angular 1, and the uh, testability is really great, and you have everything you need, like dependency injection and the whole package. But I think they had to do some stuff when it came to performance, right? So, so this was, you know, it was really dramatic in the community. You know, let this mark the day that I decided to get the hell out of web development. Really dramatic. Uh, so yeah, it's interesting. Uh, but then, you know, I think five months later or so, uh, this news came out and, you know, like, whoa, I was ecstatic myself when they said, oh, wait a second, you know, AdScript uh, was actually TypeScript all along. And Microsoft and Google decided to collaborate on the next generation of Angular. So they said, okay, we're going to use this and this will be the next version. And this article here that you see is from TechCrunch. And uh, the URL there, if you, go, if you went there, you could read in the URL, you know, hell has not frozen over yet. Indeed, hell hasn't frozen over yet. So how could Microsoft and Google co collaborate, right? That's really, uh, really crazy. Anyways, it's, yeah. So, all right, Angular 1. So it was a full room here. So you're all familiar with Angular 1 and all of those concepts here, the controllers, the, the famous two-way data binding, or the infamous two-way data binding model, right? Uh, you have your directives and, you know, great testability, you know. Forget all that, <laughs> because the next version of Angular is going to be completely different. Uh, I'm not saying that testability will be deprecated. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it, you, go, you can still test your stuff, but it will be different, okay? But all the other things, you can just forget about that. Embrace Angular 2.0, which is with TypeScript, right? Okay, in Angular 2.0, there are two things that you need to know. It's your templates and it's your components. And it's all about those components. So template or selector, I'm going to use both of those terms. Uh, if, you're, if you've worked with web components, you're going to love Angular 2.0 because it's all about that. And um, it's kind of like, it's, it's a component-based architecture. So it's like Lego, right? You put your bits and parts and you put them together. So that's your components. OK, you're going to be excited now. So no more two-way data binding. No more. The new binding is one directional. Uh, and as of today, they call it the forward binding and the reverse binding. But it's, it's actually one directional binding. And it's event. It's event based. So what that means is that uh, when you, uh, you click on a button, for instance, on your HTML, you send an event to your component. And any listeners of that type of event will get the updates reflected. Right? No more watch, no more of that stuff that watches your whole thing and does the dirty checking. It's one directional binding. And that's one of the spearhead, I mean, they're spearheading Angular 2.0 with this thing here. Because they're saying that this part here, it will drastically increase, increase your performance in Angular 2.2. So that's really interesting. All right, uh, I promised you to show you code, and I'm gonna do that. There's gonna be a lot of code in this uh, presentation. Because, let's be honest, we wanna see the code. We wanna see how Angular 2 looks like, right? Uh, but you know, I, I was, uh, 
discussing with myself if I, if I should do a lot of live coding because this thing is really unstable, right? It's alpha right now. And the TypeScript 1.6 uh, beta compiler is beta. So I'm, I don't want to uh, ch uh, challenge fate, right? And just run some code that won't work. So instead, I, I will show you a lot of code. And what's better than hello world, right? <laughs> so this is an angler to template or selector, OK? Uh, and it looks kind of familiar to something, doesn't it? It looks like a directive, doesn't it? Yeah, so that's the selector. Here is your component. This is your TypeScript class. This is TypeScript code. So as you can see here, uh, we're referencing Angular 2 at the, at the top, and that's type definition for Angular 2. How many of you are familiar with TypeScript? OK, and like maybe 20% or so. That's, OK, it's gonna be, that's really cool, because then you'll see a lot of things here, a lot of TypeScript talk. And if you want to work with Angular 2, TypeScript is going to be your, your new friend, I think, because it's really native now with the language. But it doesn't mean that you need to work with TypeScript, though. Uh, you can use uh, just ECMAScript 6 and 7. That's, uh, that's all right also, but it's recommended that TypeScript, that you use TypeScript. So, uh, all right. So here's our components. Uh, we're importing a component, which is from Angular 2, view, bootstrap. Uh, and then here is the selector, hello world. Uh, this is the template, this is the HTML part, right? And this is our view, right? Here is the class, hello world, and bootstrap, hello world. It's as simple as that. Uh, you bootstrap on the component level, right? So, so it's really as simple as that. OK, I thought I'll, I'll run this part, <laughs> right? <laughs> because it looks uh, quite uh, straightforward. So let's run this. It's uh, the same code that you saw. Uh, but you know, since we have a TypeScript component here, right? we have to compile that. So we use the TypeScript compiler to compile the TS code into JavaScript code. All right? Now, this part here may not be uh, very popular among JavaScript developers, right? because you're really writing. It's another language. It's a transpiler, the TypeScript part. So when we compile that code, this, <laughs> this is the JavaScript that gets compiled. right? And yeah, some of you will say, whoa, this is crazy, you know, like what the hell is going on here, right? But that's how, it's, that's how it is. So you work, as a developer, you work with TypeScript code. You don't work with JavaScript code. You compile the TypeScript code into JavaScript. Uh, now that in itself may be uh, demotivations for some of you, right? Uh, for some of you JavaScript developers. But that's how it is. And, uh, but again, you can use ECMAScript uh, 6 and 7, ECMAScript 7, then you'll get this, most of the stuff here, right? classes and everything. So we compile that code. And then if we look at the index HTML, this is how it looks like. So what I'm doing basically is I'm including Tracer. So do you know what Tracer does? Anyone knows? Yeah, cool. So Tracer is like uh, you take ECMAScript 6 components and it, it take, compiles them down to ECMAScript 5 so the browser can understand the code, right? Because there's no support right now. It's just, everything is so new. So this is what we're going to do so, we can, so our browser can understand the code. Uh, and then we're including system.js. So here's the cool thing. We're, we're including system.js so we can import our JavaScript code, right? So instead of referencing the, the, the JavaScript code that on the top, script equals and so on, we use system.js to import it dynamically. And then we're including the Angular 2 uh, code. So system import app. And app is the name of the JS file, right? App.js. And then we have our selector here. So very straightforward. And it should print out div hello world, right? So we run live server, so we'll set up a local host. Hello world. Great. First Angular 2 code. Awesome. All right. OK, cool. Now, let's talk a bit about data sharing, right? Now, when you write your web apps, you're going to need to work on data, right? Dynamic data. So, so you can send data between your components, and then you can show that, and so on. This is very simple. It's similar. It's the same as in Angular 1, right? So as you can see here, we have defined a variable conference, a string variable. And we're printing out conference, right? And then we're initializing that part here. So here's the constructor for this class. And then we initialize that Java zone. And then that's how it works. Simple as that. Um, yeah, so any variables that you define here in your class, that will, will, you'll uh, print them out. I, I mean, they're, they're automatically binded to your HTML code. So that's how it works in TypeScript. How does that look like? Does it look like pretty weird? I guess it looks pretty weird if you haven't worked with TypeScript before, because you have those objects and classes. 
But anyway, now the interesting part. Let's see. Here we go. The interesting part, the binding, right? The one directional binding. So what I'm, going, what I'm doing right now is I'm extending my code right, as we go through the presentation. So you'll see we're adding more features to Hello World, kind of. So um, let's see here. What I'm doing now is that uh, I'm including events because I'm, I, I want to add a button to, to, the, uh, to the app, and then I want to click on the button, and then I want to add a new row, a div row, right? So basically, here's the interesting stuff. Let's see events. We're importing click, which is an event. And then if we go here, we have click, and you have these weird parentheses, right? <laughs> so when you use those parentheses, it means this is the forward binding part. So this is when you click, this event is sent back to the component. And then you have the listeners, which are brackets. So here's the bracket. So what I'm saying is, when I click this, I want to call this function here, which is over here, and send in a car object. And listeners, which are brackets, for instance, name, will get the change here, or we get the data, so car.name. And same here. So this is how it works. And then, as you can see here, we have something called directives. So you can also use directives here in this context. Uh, and those directives looks, look like this, car name, car price. And this, is, this is something that you can also do in Angular 2. Uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, if you see here, you have your component, your logic here, and you have your template here in one file, right? It's pretty cool because it means that you can work, you can stay in the same file and work on your stuff. Now, this is, uh, we'll see how, how um, developers will uh, consider that, but, you know, at least from my experience, we're used to putting the uh, templates in other files, right? In other HTML files and refer to them. But here, you can do both. You can have the code here or you can put them in other files. Because as we know, this will, be, this will grow over time very much. Yeah. So you can, you can use both of those things. All right. But the cool thing here is that I just need to think about two things, the selector and the component. No more controllers, no more directives, no more of that, no more filters and so on. And so just two things. Uh, so, yeah. Ah, so if you look here now, uh, we have a div, and in this div we can now now we can reuse a component. That's a cool thing. So you can, if you write, if you if you create another div and uh, you type click, you send in display again on the car, then you can use that component again in, in any in any div. So any div can reuse components. So that's how it looks like. So this is like the the uh, the. Um, kind of like the short version of, the, of how the one-directional binding will work. That looks really cool. All right. Let's talk about dependency injection. Now, dependency injection is really interesting, right? Because uh, let's be honest, we all want DI when we write our code because we want to get uh, uh, dependencies on, on runtime, right? Anything that we need, we, we can inject it and we can get it at runtime. And that's really cool. And we want to wire everything on startup or at least wire everything so everything is available to us in, in runtime. So. In Angular 1, so Angular 1 has a single root injector, all right? And what that means is that you wire everything on startup. On the startup of your module, you, write a, uh, you wire everything. And you initialize your, uh, your dependencies and everything in, at the startup level. Uh, and that's it, right? It will be available throughout. So that's a single root injector. Angular 2 has a hierarchical injector, which means that you, you don't wire everything at the start, but you, you, you inject your dependencies in your components, and you get them as you need them, right? And that's lazy loading, right? So we have lazy loading here. And that's really cool, because one of the greatest things is that no more string tokens, no more of that uh, minification, more of the, no more of those minification issues that we have, right? If you guys remember, we, we always have to write, uh, like, string, you know, when we define dependencies in Angular 1, we have to, it's like string uh, comparisons, right? That's how Angular fetches the dependencies. It has to do string comparisons. Now, if we do minifications, we'll screw all that up, right? So we've had some issues with that. But Angular 2 doesn't do that anymore. Uh, it uses an interface uh, which gets types for you, right? If we're using TypeScript, so we'll get the types. And it's really flexible and makes things much easier. And since we have lazy loading, uh, that means that uh, the performance will be much better than before. So we'll get stuff just if we need them. All right. So let's uh, extend our Hello World a little, little bit. So what I'm doing now is that I'm including a dependency, Firebase, right? Uh, how many of you use Firebase today, or have worked or played with Firebase? Yeah, Firebase is really awesome for, for data, right? So I'm injecting a Firebase uh, dependency into my uh, components. So you see imports Angular Fire, Firebase, an array we're going to use also from Angular Fire. So this is included. Uh, and then 
we're binding that to Firebase. This is the binding that we do. And as you can see, it's on the component level. We're doing the wiring and everything on component level, not, not in the startup of the application. And yeah, so then we're injecting that here, Angular Fire, in our constructor, and we're setting the array. So it's pretty straightforward. So if you're familiar with dependency injection, it, this looks quite straightforward. So it's, that's all you need to do. Uh, inject your dependencies like this, include it, and it will be available if you need it uh, in your code. And that, when I say when you need it, it means that when I, if I call the to-do service here, somewhere in my component, then the, uh, the instance is created, the Firebase instance is made, created. All right. So just like Angular 1, uh, Angular 2 has built-in components. Angular 1 had uh, built-in directives right, that we could use. Let's talk about built-in components. And this is, uh, at least this, I think, I find this quite fun, actually, because they make our life so much easier, those components. All right, ng if, right? The most simple uh, compo uh, components that we have. So ng if, you can have conditions. So you can check for integers, and you can print a div. Uh, you can do string comparisons with ng if. You can also uh, call functions and return Boolean val uh, values, for instance. So ngif, pretty straightforward. Kind of like ngshow, right, <laughs> from Angular 1. ngswitch, um, switch case, pretty awesome. What's cool here is that we have, you can have multiple cases which are similar, right? So in this case, we have uh, case 2. That we have two case 2s, right? <laughs> two case 2, interesting. <laughs> and uh, so when, when case 2 hits, I will get both of those um, uh, LE um, HTML like elements, right? And then we have default, default choice. ng switch is going to be handy when we, when we start working with Angular 2. We have ng style, and this, is, uh, this should be kind of like uh, familiar to you from Angular 1. We, we can do the same thing over there also. So we can use uh, style.color like this, and we also have ng style. Both of those work. And ng style, we can then pass a CSS class, right? So we can do like this. That's pretty cool. I don't think we're going to do much of that, though, when we work with uh, our apps. We would want to put them in, uh, in other files, right? CSS files, and then reference them. So ng style, we have ng class. So you can define your CSS class on the top here. And this is, all, this is the various ways that you're going to, uh, you're going to use uh, class. So right now, it's called just class. It's not ng class. It's class. So I don't know. Maybe they, they're going to change it. We don't know. As I said, it's alpha, so this stuff is really moving. So, but we'll see. But in any case, it's the same, the same thing, the same concept. And so class, and then you can define, let's say, colored. That's the CSS class. And you could say false. It means that uh, do not use this class, basically. True, use that CSS class on my div element. And then what we could do also, we can use several CSS classes. We can use colored, round, and so on, like this. And finally, we can also uh, use uh, collections, right? for instance, or variables from our components. So if we had initialized this class to the same thing here, we could reference it like this in our HTML. All right, pretty cool. ng4. ng4 is pretty, uh, pretty known to us from Angular 1. Uh, you can loop through collections in your HTML like this. Uh, note the hashtag here. So we're going to use that. Hashtag is the same as var, right? So var c equals something, hashtag something. And then print that out. And this, is, this part is in our component. And here's the initialization of the collection. All right, the next thing is really interesting. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's called, this thing is called ng non-bindable, all right? ng non-bindable means that there are, sometimes there are parts of our web app that we don't want to compile and bind, right? We don't want to do that. Uh, I guess it's a case that may happen sometimes, right? So we can do that with ng non-bindable. So as you can see here, uh, on the top here, I'm just printing out the uh, content variable value from my component. But here, I'm using ng non-bindable. Uh, and then doing the same thing. But as you can see, this is the printout. As you can see, it didn't work here. Right? It worked here, but here it did not work. Sometimes you want to do that. May maybe because of performance issues, I don't know. We'll see, but you can do that with ng non-bindable. That's pretty cool. All right. Um, you can still use ng model, but you shouldn't, because ng model uses the two-way data binding that we have from Angular 1. Now, you can still use two-way data binding in Angular 2. Right? But you, you shouldn't do that, right? Because we don't want to do that. We want to have faster apps. But I guess some cases that you know, you, you'll have that you really need this, then you could. But you shouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, 
All right, forms. Forms are the most complicated and essential things in our web apps, right? Forms are really the core of the stuff that we do. So uh, and Angular 2 will have forms. You can, you can actually implement uh, forms, do validation, the whole package, and it's really cool. So uh, let's assume that we're creating a form. We'll use uh, ng-control. So ng-control is a field, right? ng-control is used on a field in your form, right? So that's, if we had an input uh, field, then we use ng-control, and in this case, we're calling that name. This is how you do that for each field. Here's a control group. So if we have several fields, we can, we can, uh, we can uh, create a control group that um, initializes everything, right? So we don't need to ng-control equals new ng-control and so on. We can have a control group for everything. So this is how it looks like. Um, and here is our form, all right? So as you can see here, again, hashtag f, create a local variable f equals form. Uh, again, the parentheses for, for, uh, for the binding, for the submit. And on submit, I want to pass the value of f, which is my form. It's really cool. This is all you need, right? This is the post, basically, right? So you do the post, and you send the values of your form, like this. So let's say if you're, if you're I mean, I come from a .NET background, so don't shoot me for that. But uh, if, let's say if you're working with MVC or something in .NET, then you, know, you have all those uh, really ugly stuff from Razor. Yeah, I'm criti criticizing Microsoft stuff. That's interesting. Yeah, so you have this Razor stuff, using form, sub, on submit, post, do some, so much code, right? But here, we can do that with Angular. So we can submit our stuff just by one, one, uh, one code here, one line. So we won't need a backend, a whole like backend stack with, with uh, C Sharp or Java or anything. You can just work with Angular 2, the whole thing. So, and then uh, basically here, we're creating a label and then um, ng control. This is the first name, yeah. So, and that's the form. Okay, uh, and this is the this is the function that I uh, showed you earlier. So on the sub on submit, send the value. So basically here we're printing that out, and then when you print that value now. Uh, what you're going to see is you're going to see an object with the fields, right? So in this case, we had one field, first name. So it's going to print object with that field, basically. Uh, ah, yeah. So validation, right? Uh, validation is really important, right? And it's really easy. It's at least that's what it looks like, right? I'm Angular 2 is so new, right? I've just read stuff about it and experimented with it, but it looks really easy. If that's how it's going to be, let's hope that, right? It's alpha, but. Uh, I don't think they dare uh, change stuff now. It's going to be crazy. Uh, any case, validation, really simple. Uh, we have a control. We use validators, which comes from Angular 2. Valid validators dot required. That's it. This field is now required. OK. So and in our component, we can, we, that's where we put the, where we define that stuff, right? Where we define the validations and everything, initialize them. So what we can do also, we can inject a form builder, because we don't want to do like this for each uh, control, right? It's so many, so many fields. We, we don't want to do that. So instead, we inject a form builder, and then we can uh, group them, group them like this, and then just set required on all of them. And here's the initialization, the first name. We can, we can fetch the control like this, uh, right? So this is form builder, and you can fetch it like this from your uh, view. Okay. So uh, usually, when you do validation, you want to have some conditions, right? So uh, firstly, you, uh, you have the valid, dot valid, right? So you check for valid. If my form is not valid, then I should show a warning, right? Simple as that. Um, if, let's see, again, you can also do it. So this is done on the form level. You can also do it on the control level. So if, if first name is, if just first name is not valid, then show that, uh, show that warning. Both of them work, right? Form level, control level. OK, it's going to be like verbose, so it's going to be <laughs> It's going to be longer and longer. But uh, yeah, you can also do uh, like this. You can use the uh, has error. You can use that on a class, for instance. And then you could check the control. So in this case, we want some, some styling, right? We want to show some color on the validation. So the first name is not valid. And first name is touched. This is interesting, because it means that if, if the user has actually edited the, the field or touched it from his device, then you should, uh, and, and, and it's not valid, then you should show the warning and the validation, right? OK, so if first name, you can also, first name control has this has error method that you can use. So because sometimes you, we may have other um, conditions, right? Not just required. Maybe we want to have uh, things like, you know, is this valid? Like, um, is it 
correctly written. For instance, an address has to have this and this and that condition and that and the city and so on. So we can have several other conditions. So if that one has error required, then you can use this, then you can show the error. Sorry, but that's getting longer. <laughs> so again, uh, we can also use that on form. So if the form has error required uh, and it's the first name control, then you show the, this uh, error. Okay, uh, if, let's see, here, we can also use something called find, so we can find our control from the form. And then if that is not valid, and uh, first name is touched again, we, so this is just to illustrate the find mechanism that you can use. Okay, many stuff that we can do now when it comes to forms and validation. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, sometimes you have like an address or zip code that has conditions, right? So it has to start with, with, with uh, some specific number, or something like that, so we can do that. We can have custom validation, okay? So how do we do custom validation? We can use the validators compose. So what we do is that we combine stuff, right? So we want to use the required, but then we can also, we want to create our own custom validation. In this case, a zip validator. So this is a function, zip validator, uh, takes in a control, and then if the control value does not match, if it doesn't start with zero 06, then you should uh, return this one, invalid. So it, it will be invalid if it does not start with 06. This is custom validation. So, so if, if, and then we check on the control, if it has the error invalid zip, right, which we have defined here, then we should show validation. I think this is really cool because uh, it gives us kind of an easy way to do custom validation. All right, so. There's something called observer, which is observable, right? We can use observers on our form values. So basically, if someone clicks on a field or anything, we can listen to that event. So, and that, you can do that by the observer. So, so in this case, we're just listening on value changes on first name, print, and then print the value that it was changed to, right? So this is basically like a key up or something in JavaScript, right? Key up or clicked or, yeah. And the same thing here observer on the form level. So, and here's the cool thing. So what I'm doing here is I'm typing a first name, right? Typing, typing a first name, John, right? So when I type J, start with J, it's going to listen to that and then so on, right? So I think you see the idea here. And here is the value from the form. And as I mentioned earlier, it prints out an object with the control. So J, and then I continue with J-O, and then John. So this is how it works. That's how observers work. All right. Uh, a little bit about, compon about uh, router, new ra component router. It's really just one slide because it's really new. I mean, it's really, there's so much mystery around the component router that, yeah, we're just gonna, but the, the thing that is known at this time is that you, you can have async loading of components, and that's pretty cool, right? If you want to route to several components, that is done asynchronously. Um, so there's been a lot of talks about the router, right, from Angular 1 and everything. They, they're saying they've done the new component router from Angular 2 is going to be awesome, they're saying, and uh, we're really excited about that. So let's see how it works out. But at least we know that it's async and uh, it would be much better than the predecessor. Okay, so now we get to the really interesting part, right? Migration. <laughs> so I know many of you have Angular 1 applications running today in production, right? How many of you have apps in production today? Angular 1X. Yeah, it's a lot of people, like 80%, right? So how are we going to tackle that, right? How do we do migration, right? Because Angular 1 is so different than Angular 2. And uh, if we want to, want to work with the new version, how do we do that in a smooth way? So, OK, the good news is that you can run Angular 1 and Angular 2 side by side. Uh, so if you want to work with Angular 2, you can start your application, Angular 2 stuff, while your legacy stuff, Angular 1, is working, as it should be. And they can cross, they can work together. So you can send services, inject services from Angular 1 to Angular 2, but you have to do some rewriting, right? So uh, this, this here, actually, this news here was announced, I think, two weeks ago or something, and, uh, and it's in the blog post, in the blog of the Angular team. And they said that they're going to include ng upgrade libraries that you can use that will make things easier. So, but you have to rewrite. There is no, like, there is no um, uh, seamless migration here. You have to either rewrite or you can run them side by side. So if you want to rewrite your stuff, you can do that. You basically have to think that each directive will be a component, and you can do that step by step. Now, again, the Angular team has published a step by step guide, a really specific guide that will help you on your, uh, on your applications. So, so I recommend checking that out and then, uh, and then uh, tr uh, trying to, to go through the steps 
once the time is right, right, Angular 2 is still alpha, I mean, it's going to be final in 2016. That's, that's the plan so far. So that's when it should, will be production ready. OK, but then, OK, the question is, why should we upgrade, right? Why, why should we do that? OK, there are many reasons for that. One of the main reasons is that, is that it's going to be much better performance-wise, right? So you're going to have three to five times faster rendering. And then we have, um, you know, like template recompilation. Uh, everything is done uh, pre-time, like uh, before you compile stuff in runtime. It's happened just before. We have caching and the views. And they're saying there will be a lot of lower memory usage, you know. Uh, and yeah, much powerful templating. The cool thing is DI is the DI that I talked about uh, also. And you know, and one of the one of the features that we're looking forward to is the server side rendering actually, because that you can do rendering server side. You don't have to let the client do the rendering for you. So this is also mysterious. Don't know much about it yet, but they're saying that will be possible. Uh, web workers are really interesting because uh, you'll have some threads, uh, isolated threads that could run your uh, application, which means you'll have a, a very smooth UI, um, and um, you know, like mobile app support. So for, mo for mobile, it's going to be much better, much easier, and faster as, uh, than before. That's, all this is information that's coming from the Angular team, right? We don't have experience with this yet, right? So yeah, it's, uh, it's promises, but we don't, we don't know yet. But uh, let's, let's, let's see, right? And there's more to come, more to be announced. Uh, OK, so if you should, so when Angular 2 is production ready, should you upgrade? Well, my answer is yes. You know, uh, because the world is moving, right? It's moving really fast, and uh, these guys thought that you know this is uh, this is the best approach for Angular. We have to do it like this, and I think uh, this is again, this is my personal opinion that they really got uh, inspired by React, maybe, right? Because React is quite fast, so they had to really change the architecture. So, but if you ask me if you should upgrade, yes, I would say yes. Okay, what I'm going to do now is, um, you know, there's been a lot of stuff going on in the community around Angular 2. So I'm going to show you some stuff. For instance, uh, here's this guy, uh, Sean McKay, who works at Meteor, all right, Meteor.js. Uh, and he made the performance test, okay? He wanted to compare Blaze, React, Angular, Meteor, uh, and Angular 2 combined with, with, uh, with uh, Meteor. Okay, so th this is going to be cool. <laughs> okay, look at this. <laughs> Okay, these are some of the deterministic tests that he made, okay? So, okay, in this, in this case here, what he did basically is that he was generating rows on the DOM, okay? Like 50,000 50, rows on the DOM. And, you know, this is what he got, okay? As you can see, Angular 2 Alpha is quite ahead of the others here, right? Uh, Angular 1.4 is the worst here, right? So this gives you an idea. Uh, in this case, Angular 2 Alpha really triumphed, right? So, and there we have React, uh, just, yeah, behind Angular 2 Alpha, and so on. Uh, this is the one test. The second test he made was that he tested changes, okay? And this, in this case, basically what he did was that uh, he clicked on a button, and he wanted to color, like, several text, text fields, right? So click on a button, button and then uh, you have several, uh, several text fields having, like, a color, red. So he wanted to find Waldo, right? So he clicked on the button and Waldo. All the Waldo elements in the DOM were, uh, were uh, colored red. Angular 2, again, just, you know, smashed everyone. Angular 2 Alpha uh, is way ahead, right? Uh, but, you know, again, this is just some tests that he made. And, but he also uh, put, put that, those tests and the code on GitHub. So you can, you can test that yourself and see what you get. But, you know, this is insane, right? I mean, Angular 2 Alpha is way ahead here in this case. So that's, that's cool. That's cool. Let's see. That's what's going to happen. You know, we're just building the uh, anticipation here, right? OK, this is, the, this is the one thing. The other thing is that uh, you know, Jeff Welpley and Patrick Stapleton, these guys have done an incredible job in, in the community. They've created an Angular 2 survey. And over 2,100 Angular developers across the world participated in this survey. I, I thought this would be interesting to include, uh, to show you in the presentation, because it, it will give us kind of an idea of how things will progress in the community. So, every, I mean, even AngularJS Oslo participated in this uh, survey. So, so let's, see, let's see some of the answers here, OK? Uh, OK, so what do you prefer when you're going to work with Angular 2? <laughs> what kind of transpiler? And we talked a little bit about that. Are you going to use TypeScript, ECMAScript 5, Babel? You're not sure, other. Uh, we see here TypeScript is uh, on top. That's really cool. That's really cool to see. So if I ask you now, 
Um, when the time is ready for Angular 2, are you going to work with that? Do you want to work with TypeScript? You can raise your hand for yes. Do you want to work with TypeScript when Angular 2 is ready? OK, it's like more and more. more it's like, yeah, that's cool. So maybe 60% or something. That's, that's great. You know? I'm, actually, I'm happy to see that you know, because at the beginning of the presentation, very few of you had worked with TypeScript. Right? So to see that really makes me happy. So uh, what kind of template binding syntax are you going to use? This is just uh, you know, because some people really found it drastic that uh, you have this thing, the parentheses and the brackets. It's really weird, right? So a lot of people uh, refer want to use this way of doing it. This is the actually standard way, the default way, but you can also do this. I think this is just an early answer. I think people will progress to this eventually. You just have to get used to it, but still interesting. Uh, okay, and this is something I talked about earlier. You know, the templates, are we going to have them in the component file, or are we going to separate them from the components? Uh, you know, answers were a bit... Uh, uh, mixed here, we have both an external file, for instance. That's, I think, also how, it, how it's going to be. We'll have both. We'll, maybe in some cases we'll have them in the same file. Other cases we'll put them in another file. Uh, a lot of people answered external file, I guess because we're used to that from Angular 1. So this may be, this may be the case. Inline, some people answered. You know, I, I don't recommend inline at all because uh, it really makes uh, maintenance really hard. We shouldn't, do, we shouldn't inline templates at all, uh, and so on. OK, routing, right? We don't know much about the component router. We just heard it's going to be great. So uh, a lot of people said, yeah. We have also UI router. We'll see. And you know, uh, people not sure. Uh, so it's kind of distributed. And, you know, and some are saying they're going to write their own custom router. Um, yeah, not going to go through all of them here. But you know, uh, what kind of frameworks will you use with Angular 2, right? So. We have RxJS, that's really cool because of the observables. You know, you can use observables there, and that's really been uh, interesting. Firebase, ImmutableJS, Angular Meteor, uh, yeah, kind of distributed. This, is, this question here is probably the most distributed, has the, the most distributed answer, right? And it says, you know, we'll use the server rendering stuff that they've announced. Uh, we don't know much about it yet, but we've heard a lot of great things, so probably yes. I answered yes to that one <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, editors, that I find that question quite interesting because, uh, you know, um, uh, how about you guys? Do any of you use uh, WebStorm when you work with Angular? Very few. How about Sublime? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, like, let's say Vim, for instance. Vim. Okay. What? Uh, other? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, myself, I switched to Visual Studio Code. What about Visual Studio Code? Yeah, like 2%, 1%. <laughs> yeah, Visual Studio Code, yeah, only myself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so I think Visual Studio Code is great. Uh, I used that in the small hello world earlier. I used WebStorm before, but I switched to Visual Studio Code because, you know, I work with that, and I think it's great. It fits, you know, the way of, you know, if you work with Visual Studio, you'll get used to, to it, so, okay. Uh, yeah, build tools, this is interesting. So as you can see here, Gulp is really on top here. When it comes to build, so how about you guys? Goal? Do you use Gulp for your, for building your apps? Yes. Cool. What about Grunt? Yeah, I think it's those two. So yeah, it's like 50/50. Uh, Webpack, System.js, so on. Okay. Um, what other frameworks other than Angular? Uh, Angular One X. That's also an interesting question. A lot of people answered jQuery, uh, <laughs> React. That's interesting. <laughs> you want to buy, you want to combine them? Combine those. That's interesting. Uh, how many of you use jQuery today? With Angular or you know jQuery by itself, yeah. So it's like 60%. Um, oh, React, for instance. I never asked you about React. Oh, okay, just 8%. 8% only. Okay. Well, it makes sense. You know, you're coming to an Angular 2 presentation, like yeah. So you wouldn't probably work with React. Um, what are we looking forward to? It's really. Uh, what are you looking forward to with Angular 2? It's really a hard question because we don't know much yet. Uh, really, the change detection and the, the, the binding really got me, so uh, I'm happy for that. Let's see how that turns out. Um, experience level with Angular 1x, you know, a lot, there are a lot of advanced uh, developers out there, uh, and that's kind of normal, I think, because Angular 1x has really become popular around the world. So, so, and then you have, you know, a lot of advanced people, maybe less experts, but they're still 20% experts, 21%. That's a good thing. Angular 1x is being used like uh, everywhere. So, 
Okay, um, finally, I want to really recommend this book here, Angie Book 2. Uh, a good colleague of mine, a uh, dear colleague of mine, uh, she gave me, uh, like, showed me some draft. It's in draft right now. People, they're writing the book. It's not complete yet, uh, but I've taken a look or two on it. It's really inspired me for this talk. I think this book, this book is going to be great because it really goes into depths of anger too, as it is today, of course. We don't know what's going to happen in, uh, in seven, eight months, you know. But uh, it really gives you a good idea of how Angler 2 looks and behaves like. So definitely recommendable. Uh, and I also recommend checking out the, the blog of, uh, of the Angler devs, right? It's included in my slides. 